Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gardacore's 20 Minute Tuesdays. We are so pleased that you chose to spend your time with us today, and we'll make sure to make it worth your while while you're here. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded, and all attendees are muted. But if you have a question, please pop it into the chat and we'll answer it at the end. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Milton Keith, our senior systems engineer. Take it away, Milton. Thank you, Rebecca, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to the very first of Garda Course 20 Minute Tuesdays. We're gonna be doing a brief demo today and today's topic is gonna to be mitigating ransomware with just a couple of clicks. So before I get into the actual demo, I'll cover through a few slides here. So let's cover how a typical ransomware attack unfolds. So the first thing usually happens is they want to breach the perimeter and that's stereotypically done through a spear phishing attack where the attacker sends an email targeting your organization trying to get them to open up either an attachment or clicking on a link that's serving up malware. Uh, usually after that attacker lands, they start trying to gather intelligence about your network, they start reconning it, and they want to gain privileged credentials, whether it's a domain admin or a service account. They want to get that privileged credential so they can understand your environment. And then what they want to do is they want to find your backups. They want to destroy them or encrypt those backups to make it impossible for you to restore. And then finally, after they spent time in your environment, that's when they're going to infect all your servers and drop that ransomware. Now, what they're not doing is they're not hitting zero day vulnerabilities usually with the ransomware. They're usually hitting RDP, SSH, SMB. Those are the top three common attack ports by the ransomware today. And finally, step five is encrypt everything. So another way of viewing this is let's look at this. What happens with ransomware when you don't have segmentation in your environment? The user clicks on that spear phishing attack, the email. The attacker gathers its, does its initial infiltration into your network. And then they start gathering information. They start doing the intelligence gathering. And they're able to move around laterally through your environment unhindered. So they're looking at your most critical application servers. They're trying to target your executives and see what information they can gather from your organization. And then finally, they drop their ransomware. And that's where they encrypt everything and then they demand the ransom. Now with segmentation, even if you're just doing it as simple as environmental segmentation or app ring fence, let's look at that same exact attack. The user clicks on that phishing email. The attacker begins their intelligence gathering, but the difference is, is they can't move laterally throughout your environment. So then when they do the infection, the blast radius is contained to that one user workload. So how do we avoid ending up here? And that's what we're gonna be talking about today and showing you in a demo, is we're gonna do some simple steps such as, let's control the management control plane. Let's restrict the administrator's access to your servers and they can do it from privileged administrative workstations. Let's limit endpoint to endpoint communication. And then let's protect those critical infrastructure apps and those critical business applications. And that's what we're gonna do in today's webcast. So the first thing we wanna do is, I'm gonna come in here into GuardCore and we're gonna create a policy here. And we're gonna first start off with, let's lock down administrative access or that management control plane to the servers. So I'm gonna come in here, I wanna add a new rule. And I wanna choose the destination, it's gonna be production servers. And I want the source of this to be from specific administrative workstations. So I'm gonna choose application jump boxes. Now, right now it just says jump boxes production, any ports allowed, but we wanna lock this down to specifically SSH and RDP. So I'm gonna come in here and type in 22 and 3389. We don't want them to hit any service on the production. We're gonna restrict that down to the specific processes. In this case, we're gonna say SSH daemon running at this specific path. And then we're going to come in here, I'm gonna re-edit this, and add RDP, which is running on service host. So we're locking down it to these two specific processes on that server that's listening to. But I don't want just any user on the jump box to be able to access those servers. So we're going to restrict this to, in this case, server administrators. So Gardacore can create groups inside Gardacore that map to Active Directory. And in this case, it's mapped to domain admins. And then we want to restrict which processes can they use from the jump box. So in this case, we're going to hit type in putty. 
and we're going to put the Microsoft Terminal Services client. I clicked outside the box. Let me. Must be a day that ends with a letter Y. I can't type on these days. And we're going to restrict this to just Putty and Microsoft Terminal Service Client to the specific paths. So now we have a rule that says from the jump box, server administrators that's mapped to domain admins and Active Directory can use either Microsoft Terminal Services Client or Putty to communicate to all production servers with the SSH daemon or the service host.exe, which is what RDP listens to. And let me give this a rule set name. And I'm going to say this is ransomware mitigation. And I'm going to limit the scope of this now to just ransomware. So one of the great things about Gardacore, what this rule set allows us to do is when we want to publish policy, unlike a traditional firewall, we can publish just the specific rule sets. So I'm going to keep working on just this rule set right here. And let's add a few more rules to this. So now that we've added a rule that says server administrators can talk to production, we can create a simple policy right here that says block all access to the servers on RDP and SSH. So in this case, we're just going to choose source of any. Destination again, production. And we're going to block access to 22 and 3389. And we're going to ignore whatever process is. So it could only be from that earlier rule, the jump box with the server administrators using Microsoft Terminal Services Client or Putty to the SSH daemon at this path or the Microsoft uh, Service Host. So therefore, we're going to ignore all other traffic and block it. So that simple rule right there is going to lock down your management control panel. But what about end users? Let's add now some endpoint rules. So in this case, I'm going to say source is endpoint. And destination is endpoint. But endpoints to endpoints usually shouldn't talk to each other. So what we're going to allow right here is just the desktop support users. And we're going to allow them for this, we'll just say this is a Windows shop, to be able to use the Microsoft Terminal Services client to talk to the service host on RDP. And then we will add a rule that says endpoint to endpoint denied. So again, simply clicking right here, we're going to add a block rule. And we're going to say endpoint to endpoint, any services, any ports block. So this basic policy you see right here is going to it's going to do a couple of things. It's going to restrict that management control plane to your production servers, but it's also going to significantly reduce the risk of ransomware spreading throughout your environment. We're still going to allow your desktop support to communicate to the desktop. We can add other rules such as the patch management. We can allow your desktops to get to your their EDR updates. We can say these group of users from on the desktop can use this executable to talk to specific app servers. But at the end, you want to end it with endpoints to endpoints denied, anything going to production. We can add another rule simply to the production to say anything else going to production, deny. So we'll come in here and say source any, destination production. And we're going to deny that. Now, another way of looking at Gardacore is we have these pre-built templates. So we don't have to do things purely from that firewall interface. We can do things from our maps. We have AI where we auto label and auto create policy. But in this case, let's protect a critical service like Active Directory. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna choose Active Directory. And we've already locked it down from the existing production from that rule I did earlier saying only these jump hosts can get to the production servers. But I wanna walk you through that in case this was the very first rule you were setting up. So here we're going to lock this down to the jump boxes, but we'll just specify Windows. And we're going to say next. And what's going to happen is this is a pre-built template from Gardacore. It's going to jumpstart firewalling off your Active Directory. So in this case, it says the Windows jump box can talk to the Active Directory servers on 3389. And as we did earlier, we can lock this down to specific to the server managers, that specific group. 
we can limit what processes they're allowed to use. So here I'm gonna lock this down to the Microsoft Terminal Services client. And then we're gonna say it can only go to the service host. And then the rest of the rules say the private, so that by default, that RFC 1918 address can talk to the Active Directory servers on 445, but only to the system and SMB server processes. Whereas you'd see right here, this rule allows 135, but only to service host. We allow RDP to the LSAS. And then we do our typical cleanup because GuardiCore likes to take this learning observation mode. But if we wanted to, we could completely disable these rules or delete these rules and we can add rules before we publish. Now let's look at it segmenting off a, another critical application. So in this case, I'm gonna pick on accounting. So I'm gonna come in here and choose tier segmentation. And I am going to select accounting and I wanna lock it within the environment production. So I'm not gonna apply this to development or test your QA. And I'm also gonna include the processes. So what's happening now is Gardecore is going through the production environments, looking for the accounting servers that are labeled accounting. And it's gonna look at the traffic within that accounting environment. It's gonna create policy based on the observed traffic. So without you knowing anything about your server or that application, Gardecore is going to step through based on the observed traffic and jumpstart this firewall policy. So in this case, we're saying the production accounting web server, Java process can talk to the production accounting database to the Mongo daemon on 27.0.1.7 TCP. Whereas here we're saying the network load balancer for production accounting can talk to the production accounting web server to the Java process on 80.80 TCP. And then it created a ring fence around accounting to allow anything else to communicate. Again, we can add rules, we can change, we can modify. So what that does right there is we first covered locking down the management control plane. Then we showed you a locking down simplification of locking down traffic between end user systems. And then we showed you protecting critical apps such as Active Directory, such as accounting. Now, why is this all important here? We've all seen what's going on with the Colonial Pipeline in recent news with DarkSide. So last November, or sorry, last August, I actually had the first customer that was hit by DarkSide. They were POC in Gardecore when they got hit in the division that was testing us, we stopped at Deadman's tracks. Gardecore did, or not Gardecore, DarkSide did not gain a foothold into that division. They immediately used Gardecore to help recover the rest of the divisions that were hit. And that's what we're gonna cover right now. So with Gardecore, we can actually help recover. So we get there's no silver bullet security. That's why we include breach detection inside our product. We have file reputation services where we can identify something as known good or known bad, and then we can lock it down. But we also have these instant response templates. So as I said earlier, besides RDP and SSH, SMB is the third most attacked port with ransomware. So here's a simple template that we can choose the SMB file servers choose which workstations that are not allowed to encrypt any files to those SMB file servers. Another lockdown policy could be, let's stop all lateral movement with the exception of the domain controllers and exception of those privileged administrative workstations, whether they're jump boxes or terminal servers. But another thing we do is we can allow a phased approach. As you're looking at your applications, you know if I wanna bring up the billing server, maybe it's dependent upon another system. So that's where we can say, okay, Billing system is clean. Now we want to monitor this other system is dependent upon to make sure there's nothing suspicious going on and keep the rest of the environment isolated. And as you move from isolated to monitor and monitor clean, it allows you to take this phased approach. Another unique feature about Gardecore is Gardecore Insight. It's based off of OS query. So in this use case, I don't have ransomware running around my demo environment, but I do have a malicious version of SolarWinds. So we all know about the SolarWinds exploit and I always say if there's one server I can hack, it would be your patch management server because it has privileged rights throughout your environment. So one of the ways of mitigating that is you can use Gardecore to create FQDN policy. So if I come back and let's go look at some of our other rules here. And let's see, do we have some for FQDN rules? We can say here production servers are able to get to, in this case, Snapcraft content and Ubuntu.com and Snapcraft.io. Therefore, anything else it tries to go to, it's gonna be blocked. So simple DNS policy. 
But the challenge with SolarWinds hack was the company itself was hacked into and their binary was modified. So their distribution was modified. And when customers had it locked down and said, yes, the SolarWinds server can only go to SolarWinds.com, it still pulled down that modified version of SolarWinds. But the first thing that modified version of SolarWinds did is went out to other domains to pull down other malicious scripts. So by having a simple FQDN policy, you would block those additional scripts. Now for customers that only had saying SolarWinds or Ryan can talk 161 UDP and ICMP throughout the network, they still pulled down the malicious scripts, but as soon as they tried to run, Gardaquil blocked them because their policy had locked it down to more of a state of zero trust. But then we come in here and we use Gardaquil Insight and we can run a query to see what vulnerable versions of SolarWinds does it exist in our environment. So we do that query in real time. We can look for specific registry settings to make sure, oh, we now need to apply this patch. This is what that ransomware actually got through in case it was something other than traditional RDP, SSH, or SMB. If they did hit another vulnerability, we can look for and make sure those systems are patched. So that's it for our demo today. We said we'd keep this into 20 minutes or less. So at this point in time, I'd like to see, do we have any questions? Yeah, we actually have a couple. And uh, the first one, Milton, is what changes to the network are required to implement Gardaquil? That's a great question. So Gardaquil was designed with the data center from day one. We require zero changes to your network. We don't require any changes to your applications. You don't have to worry about re-IPing or put them in different VLANs. You don't have to change anything about your hypervisor. So you're not creating any of this crazy hairpin or horseshoe type routing. We don't even require reboot or restarts of the server. So we can go in with zero disruptions, no outages whatsoever in both your data center and your endpoints. Any other questions, Rebecca? This one more. Um, how intensive is the resource consumption of this firewall client? Uh, another great question. So GuardCore, as I said earlier, is designed from the data center from day one. So we actually have it hard coded with how much CPU and memory we can use. On average, we run at 0.1 of a single percent of CPU, and we run at 45 megabits on average in memory, but we can't use more than 200 megs of memory. Fantastic. Thank you, Milton. Um, that looks to be the last of our questions for today. So I'd like to say thank you for everyone for attending today's 20 Minute Tuesday. Um, our team will be reaching out over the next couple of days to see if you have any further questions. I do want to make you aware of that next Tuesday, we will be discussing zero trust. So feel free to join us then as well. Have a great day.